Right guys, I am back. <clears throat> Let's do a quick revision of what we did since morning. So we. OK, so we started with um, normal electrical um, electrical signals and then we converted them to uh, uh, a digital signal. So like a series of ones and zeros using a device called diode. Then we looked at the number system. Uh, the decimal number system is that we use uh, on a day to day basis. But then storing decimals in computers is going to be challenging and difficult. Instead, what we do is we store information in the form of binary, uh, in the form of magnetic field, magnetic uh, flux, and then that flux indicates uh, either a zero or a one. So then we needed a way to map the decimal number system to the binary number system, and that's where uh, the concept of radix is so important. Um, a zero indicates probably absence of magnetism, one indicates probably presence of uh, the magnetic field. <clears throat> And then these values together, it is easier to store them in computer, uh, extract them and work with them. Then we saw uh, th there are challenges when we want to convert from uh, decimal to binary because uh, the number of unique digits and the unique combinations, they don't match. And that's why we have number system like octal and decimal where there is a one to one mapping between an octal number and three digit binary equivalent or a four digit binary number and uh, a hexadecimal value in it. Now using weighted uh, multiplication or raising uh, radix into the weight of the bit, we can figure out the actual value and we can also convert between one number system to another number system. Then we saw some arithmetic operation as to how the arithmetic operations are performed in um, in decimal and then we devised a similar strategy of adding two binary numbers. Then we studied uh, logic gates and then logic gates. Uh, they have a specific series of input and specific dictated given output and that output is called a truth table. Now a logic gate internally can be built using a series of transistors and diodes um, if, I, if I remember right and then they ensure that for a combination of input you're going to get a specific output according to that rule. Now these logic gates by themselves, they are not effective, but then when you start putting them together, they can perform the automatic calculation for you. So if you change the state of these two flips with um, a little delay, uh, the output on the other side of the line is going to reflect the operation. We, we built a small adder which is going to add two bits, like two single bits and going to give us the result. Then we saw that addition um, is straightforward, but then subtraction is a little tricky because um, you will have to carry from the left and from the right and then in binary it, it is going to become very difficult. So then we found out uh, a trick of mathematics which is called complements and in complement we uh, find out the difference between the radix and the negative number at hand and we convert those numbers. Uh, when we convert it that way, it is called once complement. And then in once complement uh, in binary, we flip all the bits. So zeros become one and ones become zeros. And um, that lead gives us uh, two values for a negative zero. For zero, there are two values. One is all zeros, one is all ones, which is which is not very effective. So then we switch to another complement mechanism, which is called twos complement. Now using twos complement, we, we flip all the bits first and then we add another one to it and in that ways zero will always have a unique zero value. So when somebody gives us a subtraction operation, we actually do two's complement first and then we add those two numbers and depending on what kind of result is generated, we decide if the sum was a negative number or a positive number and if it's a negative number, we do a two's complement one more time. Right, so this has been pretty straightforward so far. We put these multiple adders into um, or multiple logic gate devices into a unit in the microprocessor, which is called ALU, the arithmetic logic unit, and it performs all the arithmetic operations for us. But they themselves, they are like very still hardware bound. So we have to, we have to flip switches uh, like these, and then we are going to get the output. Uh, there are better ways of doing that and when the microprocessors uh, grow bigger. When you wanted to get more done using these uh, logic gates, we started coming up with 
something called the microprocessor. And then each microprocessor is going to have a lot more component inside it compared to the simple, the simple architecture or uh, the printed or, or the PCB boards that we have seen. So let's go ahead and the, the microprocessor that we're going to look today is microprocessor 8086, 8086. And probably this is the 8086 chip, if I'm right. So this is Intel 8086. Right, and the internal architecture diagram of 8086 is over here. So let me open this image in the new diagram. All right. The logic gate diagrams that we saw, the 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 adders, uh, there are like multiple such adders inside uh, this particular ALU. But then there are multiple other things that are present here as well. Right. This is something called as the register set. A register set is combination of multiple of these inputs. So like we had this one line over here, which is A and a B line. What 8086 does is it has a register which has 16 on the A line. The lower eight are called AL, the upper eight are called AH. Then there are other general purpose registers like B, C and D. And there is something called a stack pointer, base pointer, stack index and data index. So these are for, for data and notice that there's something called as operands and there's something called as flags. <clears throat> Another component is called a control unit and notice that it is saying that there is six byte prefetch queue. We're going to talk about this shortly, but then let's go ahead and look at uh, this other part of the diagram. CS is a code segment, SS is a stack segment, data segment, extra segment, and an instruction pointer. And then notice that this little part here is connected to memory input and output. So with this, let's go ahead and create our first microprocessor uh, block diagram. So if I were to draw it, I'm going to put it like this. So there's going to be uh, a component. This green box here is the processor. And then this processor here is connected to the memory. So the digital circuit diagram, the diode diagram that we saw, and we were saying that it can store zeros and ones, it is going to have multiple such blocks. Now, these two devices, they are going to communicate. And then when they want to communicate, they would give it an address. So the address is generally represented in the form of uh, in the form of hexadecimal number and hexadecimal number. They always start with something called uh, with, some, with zero X, right? And then um, this is a 64 bit RAM, so it is going to go all the way up to FFFF. So if you are interested, go ahead and do uh, a math on this and try to figure out it is going to come out to be 64,535, I guess. All right, so it is going to have 64,000 unique byte level information. All right, this is this is not for 8086. 8086 goes up to 1 MB and 1 MB is um, probably 1024 into 1024 bytes. Uh, that is going to have another F over here. OK. What it does is it divides this RAM, um, the green chip that you see in your computers generally. It is going to have this 1 MB of memory space for the processor 8086. Now, when the processor wants to read something from the RAM, it is going to put up an address, say 0x0100, and then that address here is going to probably point to um, 8 bits or 16 bits, right? Depending on uh, depending on what the other instructions are saying. But all the information that we that we have, they are present in the RAM. And then this is the processor. So the processor is going to look a lot like this. The inside of the processor is like this. And the RAM itself is going to have these small addressable um, addressable bits and bytes that are the representation of that are stored using in the form of electric current or magnetic field inside inside a chip. OK, uh, now. What we discussed so far as um, those adders and um, 
those logic get circuits. Those circuits are present over here, but because you don't want to flip switches and give different instructions to these small chips, right? What you would do is you are going to move the operation set inside. Now there are ways in which you can inform the ALU as to what operation you want to perform. So this side is going to be the input side. And this is going to be the memory side, and then it can probably have an output side as well. So once again, most of our devices, I mean, we can connect LEDs here one more time, or we can probably connect bigger monitors as well. So depending on how sophisticated program is running inside this thing, we can control the output on the monitor itself. <clears throat> but for input, uh, this time we can have uh, a keyboard connected over here, and then keyboard can give uh, different inputs. So let's go ahead and see if we can have um, I don't know if you're going to find a good device, but then 8086 is going to look like this. So this is a significant upgrade. So this is a significant upgrade over this circuitry over here. The circuit, once created, it can only do the addition operation. right? Because it is hardwired into doing specific things, but then somebody went ahead and did the pains of making this very small and then putting it in probably this is the chip over here. All right, and then this becomes your input device and depending on how you enter those keys, it is going to control the operation of um, this particular chip. And for that, we're gonna go back to this diagram here. So the control unit is going to have specific commands inside it and it is going to send those commands to ALU. This ALU using a combination of operands and flags, it is going to perform the math operation that we were performing using the switches in the previous diagram, and it is going to output it back, and it is going to put it in one of these um, general purpose registers. And then these registers, they are going to once again, send it back to the input or the output device. And for this, for, to understand this, there are going to be multiple instructions that are going to control the, the control unit, the ALU, the registers, and these command instructions as well. Now, if I can draw a different view of this particular um, RAM, the memory, um, let's call it RAM. A RAM is going to have, in, in good old 8086 days, a RAM is going to have multiple components inside them. And then probably electronic students, they are going to have better understanding of this part of uh, concept. So suppose that this is one MB of memory. When you write a program such as, let's just go ahead and write a small program. So I'm going to write a main here. I'm sure that all of you have seen um, integer j equal to 10 integer then I do integer result assigned to zero, and then I do result equal to I plus J, and I'm gonna just say, uh, okay, I can, I, can, I can probably live with this. <clears throat> now this, we change the name from main to add. All right, so there's integer I, J, and there is result. Uh, I storing value 20, J storing value 10, and the result is going to have, after the end of program, is going to have the summation of these two numbers. But then this 20 is decimal value, right? This is something that we understand. So these are these are high level programming languages that human beings can read, write, and understand and make sense out of. But then this is not what the ALU is going to understand because the ALU or the other devices that we have seen so far they were working in the binary format. They would need input in this format. If they want a subtraction operation, they would have to complement these numbers. So there is some operation, there is some operation that will have to perform on this particular piece of code that we already know how to write and convert it into a format that the microprocessor can understand, All right? So 
before we get to this point, this is what we're going to do for 8086. Uh, your executable file is something that is going to be a, a, a series of ones and zeros. And in those ones and zeros, they are going to do exactly this. Microprocessor have a different way of declaring these things. So when you declare a variable I and then say that give it a 20, what it does is it actually assigns uh, a memory location and then it. It puts a value of 20 inside. Uh, inside a specific memory location, so you will have to as microprocessor programmer, you will have to give it an address and you will have to tell the value where you would want to store that particular information. Right. If you want to store 20, you're going to choose a different address and you're going to put that address over there. And then if you want to initiate initial initialize result, you will have to give it a different address and initialize that result as well. So J was 10. Let me fix that. And when you want to add I and J, you're going to run instruction like add 500 and 600. Right now, this is still human readable, but then the next step for this work is that you're going to identify how to move, how to convert this value into a series of uh, hexadecimal sequences. So it is going to probably look something like this to F and the next instruction is going to be say 60 FF and say uh, A because 10 is A and the next instruction probably is going to look like this. I'm just making it up. Right, so it has moved something to 1000. So I'm going to say because move is 50. And then it's a different address. I'm going to put another address over here and then it is 1000. So I'm going to put something like 500 and 0. And for add probably I'm going to give a code of 60 and I'm going to say say FF and 1 to FF. Right, so this is an exe inside your computer. What we did as 8086 programmers is we used this particular diagram and then notice that there are small um, that there are the, this keyboard present. If you give a specific sequence, we can start adding these numbers as EXEs into these chips. All right, and these chips, they are going to store these values and this is going to become your executable program that the processor can understand. Right, and then this is the language of 8086 processor, and there is there are ways of converting this program into this exe code using something called uh, a mnemonic chart. So we're going to search for 8086 mnemonics of code list, and if we are lucky, we're going to find it. So notice the instructions that we have available inside 8086 processor. One instruction is called add. Another instruction is called and, right? So these two instructions, they are definitely going to get executed inside the arithmetic and logic unit. This is arithmetic operation. This is the logic operation. Then we have instructions like CMP, which is the compare instruction. Then we have. Uh, then we have. A move instruction move SB. There is another move instruction. So if you want to move some data from one location to another instead of 50, we are going to say 0x10 0x a0. So this is not actually 50. This is 0x a0. Right and if you give this particular sequence to the microprocessor, the microprocessor is going to execute your your program. There is an instruction for multiplication. There is a uh, this is the tools complement negation. So if I give negate and provide this series, it is going to negate that particular value. So if I have to take tools complement of say 20, I'm going to put 0x20 over here. And then this is going to become a command for the processor. But then this is very difficult for us to write. And then that's why we use something called a mnemonic code. And then this is the microprocessor programming. And then when we move to the high level programming world, this is how we write computer programs. So I, I hope through this example, you would understand that high level programs, they eventually get converted to the EXE and EXE is a series of commands that the processor can understand. 
with higher level programs, it is possible. So, so this is the exe that is going to get stored inside this particular RAM. But then it is it is not just exe or the instruction that you would want to save. There are also uh, commands and there are also data that you would want to save. And inside a RAM, you are going to create different sections and each section is going to have separate part for it. Right. So if you want to save code, you're going to as um, as a microprocessor programmer, you are going to come here and you're going to allocate a specific uh, space for this and you're going to say that uh, I'm going to code store code from 00 to say 2000. From 2000 onwards, I'm going to store data. And then um, there is something called as stack. We're going to talk about that very shortly. And then from FF, 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 um, these are five F's because it is one MB. Over here, I'm going to store the stack value. Right, so this entire series that we, we, we wrote here, it is going to go and sit in this particular. It is going to sit inside this particular section. All right, the data that we have inside uh, our application um, this is an incorrect thing that I'm drawing here, but the data is going to sit on this particular part of uh, the process. So all the variables that you declare, uh, all these strings that you want to save, uh, can you guys go mute? All right, thank you. So if you have any data like 20 and 10 and zero, you are going to store them inside this particular section from 2000 onwards. So 20 probably sits here, 10 sits here, zero sits here. And when we have the result 30, we're going to modify this zero to a 30. That part is going to sit over here. Now, to identify, to identify what piece of code is going to run, inside our processor architecture diagram. Right, there are specific registers. So if I can copy this image and paste it over here. Right, so what we have is the exe. The exe is loaded into RAM and then we have some data and then the data is also available in RAM. The code segment is going to store the starting address of the code. So because it is 0000, it is going to store 0x00. Then there's something called as instruction pointer. Now instruction pointer initially always, I am guessing is that it is also going to be 00. And then it is the combination of the CS and IP register that the first instruction is loaded at the processor, right? So it is a CS colon IP value that decides which instruction is going to get executed. And then in the first instruction, it says 0x a0, which actually indicates a move operation. So in the move operation, it is going to say that, hey, okay, you, I understand that you want to move, but then what do you want to move? So you want to move, say, um, 2f value inside a memory address called ff. So after this instruction, the ff is, so this ff here is going to represent this particular memory location and we are going to put a 2f over here right it is because of this memory uh, this instruction that this part is going to get modified when this operation is completed the ip value two bytes one byte and one byte is going to get incremented by say four bytes and it is going to become 0x04 and then on 0x04, we have another instruction. This probably is going to take six bytes. So then it is going to inc increment by six bytes and it's going to become A, 0x0A. And on A, we have another instruction. So this combination of CS and IP, it is going to, it is going to tell which is the next instruction that you would want to get executed. And at each instruction, the effect is going to get um, executed. Like you're going to, populate values from memory, you're going to push values, uh, you're going to perform the add operation. And then depending on the instruction that you are giving, 
it is either going to communicate to the input output devices or if it is an instruction like add it is going to come back all the way to the alu and it is going to do the add operation right and then these add operations they are eventually going to save the values inside these registers all right and this is how this is how our program executes now coming to the stack part when you are building bigger applications you are not going to have only one small add function your code is going to look a little complicated so you're going to have a main starting point which is something outside and then inside main you're going to call the add function and then add is a very complex operation so you're going to have multiple commands inside add as well you're probably going to do some form of logging and say some form of operations some database persistence some client requirements for example right they are all going to sit here when we perform when we create a code for this that code is going to look a lot complicated than this but then because we are calling an add function over here add function itself is going to get defined in the exe in the form of an of a label so when somebody says that okay so the command over here is going to look like this call add the call command is going to start looking for a label called add and then that label is going to be somewhere over here and over here you're going to perform the logging operation and the actual operation operation so when you do this the microprocessor internally tries to resolve the address of this from the ram all right and then to take care of this operation when this operation completes, the microprocessor is going to figure out of where to jump back. So suppose this call itself was address say X and then the next instruction is Y. Before the call happens, it is going to save the address of Y inside the stack as like the first entry. OK, when it goes to add, it figures out that there is another call called um, L, so it is going to say L is sitting at an address of Z and after it comes back, it is going to come back to an address uh, say C, right? It is going to push C inside the stack and it is going to go inside the uh, the logging function. Now, when this function series ends, there is going to be a special command called return. Now, when return happens, it is going to go to the stack. It is going to pick up the value which is at the top and it would know that when this completes, I have to jump back to Z. So it is going to make that jump from the logging function to the Z function. Now, what we have already established is that the code segment and the instruction pointer, they together control the execution of a program. What C and Y, this Y here and then the C here indicates is the value of the instruction pointer or a combination of the code and the instruction pointer. What happens through that is, when we execute the return statement, it goes to the stack, it picks up the value of C, and then this value of C is assigned to the instruction pointer. Right, and that's how the instruction pointer knows that, yeah, I'm probably done inside this function. I have to go back to the calling function, and the calling function is present over here. When we see another return statement inside the add function, it is once again going to go back to the stack. It's going to find out that the, the current value is Y, so it's going to jump to Y and then Y is probably the next instruction after a call to add over here or in the microprocessor code over here, this next add instruction. All right. To store because stack is works a little different. It is finishing what is what we have available. Why stack is going to work upside down and that's why stack is always drawn as, as the last element inside um, the microprocessor and it kind of works up but then code and data they work upside down so code starts in the beginning it goes down this is where your exe and command to microprocessor sit this is where uh, the actual data data is going to sit the, the variables that you declare um, the, the um, data on which the operations are going to happen it is going to sit on this part and then the data and the stack they are going to move towards each other and if you allocate a fixed space to data, um, this is where you create the extra segment or the ES. So let's go back to the processor diagram once again. And let's look at this. So code segment points to the beginning of code segment. IP points to the current instruction that is in execution. 
uh, the stack segment points to this location, which is the end of memory for uh, this thing. And then the way we have IP for code, we have SI for stack. So it is not just um, SS registers that is going to point here. It is a combination of two registers that is going to point here. So it is going to be SS colon SI. And it is this SI that is going to dictate how the stack is going to work. And then data is pointed over here with data segment. It does not have. Um, OK, so there's a DI register. I'm forgetting the use of this, but then um, there is DS and there is ES. So when we so see that, say that we have an EXE created and EXE is going to get loaded by the operating system inside the memory and the program is going to start. The program starts when CS and IP has the starting point address pointed to it. Right when we make, make multiple call statements, the stack segments starts to fill up from the bottom to the top. Uh, I'm sure that some of you might have seen a stack segment overflow um, exception, and that exception happens when the stack has grown all the way to the top and it is now reaching in the data part. When that happens, we are going to see that error. Along with this, all the variables like i and j, they don't get stored in data, and I told you that I'm telling you something wrong. They don't get stored in the data part. They get stored in the stack segment part. So as soon as the program starts, the variable i and variable j, they're going to find a spot here. The variable result is also going to point uh, find a spot here. And then that's why every time you call the function, you call a function, the local variables and the function parameters, they're going to get declared inside the stack. And when that function returns, everything is going to be returned back to the stack once again. So the stack kind of grows and shrinks with every call of the function. Right, and then if I have to go jump ahead of myself and tell you what um, stack segment is, if you have declared a static variable, it is going to sit here. If you worked with pointer and use the new keyword to assign memory, that memory is given from the data segment. It is not from the stack segment. So stack is for parameters and it is for local variables. For global variables, for static variables, for pointer memory allocation, the data comes from the data segment. The reason I'm going in such depth is because this is where uh, .NET garbage collection and function pointers it is going to um, it is going to come in um, become very effective. All right, so let me pick up the next topic. All right, so we have seen microprocessor, we have seen memory segmentation, and we have seen operating systems. So last topic for today, uh, I'm going to talk about something called um, um, viruses. We know that the code segment and instruction pointer, the combination of these two decide which code, code to execute. So if you want to be a virus developer, all you have to do um, probably it is a little complicated these days, but then all you have to do is that you have to write your deadly. Let me use, use a deadly color. All right, this is your malicious code. This malicious code probably is going to read your um, credit card information, something something terrible that it's going to do, right? If I using some combination, some trick modify the CSN IP from the good code, which was doing addition operation, and if I point the CS and IP over here, it is going to execute this code, right? And to do that, I'll have to create a label of this virus. And in some way, I'm going to inject a call statement to the virus code over here. Now, when I do this, OK, when I manage to creep into the EXE, and if I manage to tweak the value of CS and IP, it is going to make a quick jump to my code it is going to execute whatever code is written here, whatever intention were, and then it is going to execute a return statement. So with this return statement, or even without a return statement, if I just modify the IP, I can go back to this particular code, right? So our innocent looking code is going to do its job, and then some code is going to find out an empty block in our code. It is going to make it jump to their code, the code is going to get executed. It's going to finish its job. It's going to come back and our code will keep running. 
it was extremely possible inside 8085 and 8086, right? And uh, there were assignments that we have done during our engineering, which were exactly this, that we are going to interrupt the flow of an ap application execution. We are going to inject our code. Our code is going to do something and it is going to go back. So it is, it is one of the assignments that we have worked on. They were not very strong, very powerful, very, very lame viruses that we had created. Like everything that they're typing, we are going to convert it to uh, capital letters. So regardless of the caps key on and off, it is always going to be capital letters. So so we have done those kind of things, uh, but the, the, the whole trick is that you influence the execution flow. And then it was possible in uh, smaller processes, but then when processor quality changed, when more advanced processors like A0386 started coming, they influenced this structure of RAM itself. So I'm going to go ahead and draw the memory once again. So this is our RAM. And then mind you that the RAM capacity by this time has increased significantly. So it is not one MB of memory. There was significantly higher uh, memory. The only problem inside 8086 or in this particular um, way of memory was that there was no restriction as to how far the code can be, how how big the data can be, or how the stack can grow. What is your 386 proposed, which was uh, a significantly improved microprocessor, is that we are not going to have only one RAM. We are going to have multiple uh, multiple, what do you say, components to uh, our solution, our, our uh, architecture. So this black rectangle here is the, um, is the, is the memory, is the RAM. And then this green one here is a virtual table. And then I'm gonna draw it inside of uh, a processor, right? Now I'm not, com I'm not completely right, uh, but then the 386 processor, it kind of sits here and this is the RAM and this is the page table. Now I'm forgetting something as to where it happens, but then you're going to have code segment that starts somewhere in between, say at 200 and it's going to go up to 2000, right? This is going to be your entire EXE. So let me go ahead and copy our EXE once again. And our EXE from our innocent looking ad program is going to come and sit over here. Now there is an empty block that that we see, okay? And then this empty block can point to say this location where there can be a virus, but then what page table says is that I am going to store the starting address 200 and the end address of this particular thing and there are two bits over here, like 00. So if it is 00, it is going to indicate that only instructions from 200 to 2000, they are going to get executed. So if I want to write a CS and IP register, CS and IP can never ever go outside this boundary. So that is trick number one. Trick number two is 00 is going to assign, 00 is probably going to mean code, all right? And then, Similarly, we are also going to de de declare a data segment. So data segment say starts at 4,000 and it is going to go up to 8,000. All right, so it starts at 4,000. It goes all the way up to 8,000. But then the last two bits of this particular thing will be 0 and 1. So 0 and 1 is going to indicate data. Now I'm forgetting what these values were, but then let's just continue with the discussion. So this segment is going to be data. If somebody very smartly tries to trick and changes CS and IP to somewhere over here. Because the microprocessor understand that this range is definitely data. It is not going to load the instruction from this thing inside our ALU. And those ALUs are to begin with not going to receive that instruction itself. They are going to understand that somebody is trying to execute data as code. Right, because a 50 here, probably if it means move, a 50 here should not mean move, right? A 50 here is data 50, right? And this is the code 50. 
So code actually goes to ALU or probably the little box here that we call the control unit and the control unit then decides what to do with that code 50. Right? It decides if I want to read more data, if I want to perform some operation, but then the data 50 probably should only go over here in the AX and BX, the general purpose registers. And then it is for the first time that the AD H0386 processor, it could mark what does specific location inside RAM mean to the processor as a whole. And that's how uh, we were able to um, write um, better protected virus free systems. All right. Now, another thing uh, that I would want to communicate at this point is. For some code to run, they will have to have special values provided by the processor. So a combination, say one one is going to indicate that it is the CPU requesting that. So if a CPU says that change CS and IP from say 200 zero to 4K zero, then that is a valid instruction because that is something that the operating system is doing and that operating system is called the kernel part. Now kernel is something that the operating system and processor they have an understanding in between and then let's just assign it value one one. Some of you can say that hey as an administrator, can I do everything? And the answer is no. So administrator of a computer, it is a software level thing. So when you add users to your uh, computer, you say that hey, I'm the admin user An admin user is. Um, a software. Level security. Right, it is it is not kernel mode. A kernel mode can influence your hardware. It can say that hey, the RAM is going to do this. This part of RAM is only going to um, get executed inside the control unit. This part is only data. Um, I have say um, this is 4 MB of RAM. Using kernel mode, I can give a projection that I don't have 4 MB of memory. I have only 256 KB of RAM. All right, so this is 256 KB. So using this special mode when the CPU is like controlling everything, it is the kernel mode that gets activated and it can create a different view of the space table. It can give you a different view of the number of CPUs that you have. It can even control the RAM that you have and it can even control. So if I can draw a hard drive here, it can even control the hard drive that you have. Right, so if you have say 1 GB of hard drive, 4 GB of hard drive, it can give you a projection that it is only 200 MB of hard drive that I have. And that is the special kernel mode and the Linux operating system is like um, has amazing features of controlling these hardwares through its operating system features. All right. So those are the planned topics for today. All right, tomorrow when we connect, we are going to talk about. Uh, we are going to take a deeper dive into programming itself, but then I, I, I would share the sheet with you and I want you to go ahead and take a revision of this. Um, OK, one concept um, that I should cover before we move forward. When we said call, we provided an address over here and then this address over here is kind of pointing to one of the pins on the chip that we have here and then that chip probably is going to give us some data. So this address is actually a memory location and a memory location always has the size of the address capacity. If you if you study these diagrams more closely, what you see the way this unit is connected to memory is always four bytes and because it is four byte, an address is always going to be four bytes and then this concept is going to come in extremely handy when we study function pointers and alloc um, and delegates. OK, so I want you to go and revise this section. I'm going to share the sheet with you. Uh, hopefully uh, the color coding is um, Help is going to help you recollect uh, all the concepts that we covered. OK, so that's it for today. Um, we're going to end this session. Uh, I'm going to be here for 10 more minutes. If you guys have any question, feel free to ask.